Well, good morning and welcome to our first edition of Cosmic Conversations from Morrison Planetarium at the California Academy of Sciences. My name is Ryan Wyatt. I'm the Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization at the Academy. And it's a great pleasure to launch this uh, streaming program, which we'll be doing every Friday at 1130 uh, a.m. Pacific uh, with Dr. Robert Hurt from the Spitzer uh, Space Telescope down in Pasadena, California. Uh, so welcome, Robert. Great to see you, virtually at least. Well, likewise, Ryan. Always a pleasure to chat. And, and uh, on one of my favorite topics in the universe, actually. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the um, the cool thing is that we're going to have a chance to introduce this amazing uh, planetary system uh, that Spitzer wasn't involved with discovering, but it was critical in helping us understand uh, the details of this amazing uh, planetary system. And uh, and then also um, uh, be able to visualize a trip to this system uh, later in the about 20 minutes or so that we have together. So uh, Robert, if you wanted to just launch into a little bit about uh, TRAPPIST-1, um, I'm sure we'd love to hear more. Sure, so um, basically anyone who's interested in exoplanets, I think the uh, they need to know about the TRAPPIST-1 system because it's incredible. It is located in our cosmic neighborhood. It's only about 39 light years away. And it is a system that contains seven known Earth-sized rocky planets. Uh, there, there's no other system that we know of so many Earth-sized planets at this point. Um, it was actually discovered by ground-based observations um, that were actually designed to look for exoplanets orbiting very small stars, M-dwarf stars. Now, these are, these are the smallest stars you can have that are actually still going to have nuclear fusion generating energy in our cores. So they're only about the size of Jupiter, maybe 50% bigger than Jupiter. Uh, they're very cool. They're less than half the temperature of our sun. So their light's very kind of orange, like a, like a low wattage light bulb. And what's interesting about them is that if you're looking for Earth-sized planets, it's a lot easier to see an Earth-sized planet against a star that itself is only about the size of Jupiter. Now, you know, the, they were discovered through the transit method and just as a, a, a Primer for anyone who doesn't remember, like if this is this is my stand-in for a star, and this is my stand-in for a planet. When when planets orbit their stars, uh, they they go around in a regular pattern, and if that system happens to be aligned in just the right way, where the orbit of the planet takes it across the face of the star, there's a point at which the amount of light we see from the star is reduced because the planet's cutting into some of that light, and when that happens we can actually deduce that there must be an object that passed in front. And from the amount, from the fraction of light that is blocked by the planet, we can actually figure out exactly how big the planet is. This is how the bulk of exoplanets have been discovered. In the case of TRAPPIST-1, we have a system where there were at least three planets discovered by ground-based observations on the TRAPPIST telescope that was specifically looking at about 30 uh, M-dwarf type stars for this kind of factor. But the signal was very hard to interpret. There were extra reductions in brightness there that were kind of confusing. So um, it turned out they wanted to be able to observe this for a much longer period of time to try to disentangle what was going on. This is where NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope came in. Um, because of Spitzer's unique vantage point in space, a long ways away from the Earth and its own orbit around the sun, it was able to devote uh, 500 hours of direct stare at this one system uh, broken only by periods where it had to rotate its radio dish to Earth and, and transmit its data uh, to us. And even that, those uh, those breaks were generally covered by ground-based observing. So we were able to basically do a timeline of 500 hours. And from that, we got this incredible signal of tons of little dips in brightness at different cadences, each one corresponding to a different planet. So so the, um, the population of the TRAPPIST-1 system jumped from three probable planets to seven confirmed Earth-sized planets. And because they orbit so close to their star, the years on these planets are at range everything everywhere from a few days to about 20 days long. So the other thing that's really cool about this is because you have so many Earth-sized planets at so many different distances from their sun, it's a real sampling of all the different kind of conditions you might expect Earth-sized planets to fall under. Some are very close to their star, and so their temperature is very hot. They may be more like uh, the, the conditions of Venus. Some are very far away, uh, uh, receiving less light proportionally than, say, uh, Mars does. Uh, so they're very uh, cool. 
And a few of them fall right in what we traditionally would call the habitable zone. With, I, I might actually call more like the, uh, the uh, surface ocean zone, which is if you have an Earth-sized planet that has a supply of, of water on it, uh, what would be the distances from a particular star where it would be about the right temperature that water could form liquid oceans on its surface? So we have uh, three of them that fall somewhere in that range comparing to you know, what we see in our own solar system. So yeah, it's, it's a remarkable collection of worlds. And by studying them at uh, uh, having the ability to spend long periods of time studying them, and repeating these observations again throughout the calendar, we actually had an opportunity to, to really measure a lot more about these than we can for other Earth-sized planets we've discovered. Uh, Super sorry, cool. I'm actually, it's on a roll here, but uh, do you want to <laughs> no. do you wanna, um, we can switch over and we could uh, actually start at Earth, talk a little bit about um, the habitable zone of our own planetary system, and then head over to TRAPPIST-1? Absolutely, yeah. OK. Bring up our own solar system. Very good. So we'll just start here at Earth, and I'll have to excuse myself. You will see my cursor uh, on the screen as I pilot through the known universe. Um, but we and can pull back. Not a near Earth cursor. <laughs> no. We're we're not extinction. Uh, we're not under threat of a global cursor extinction event. <laughs> it would be a it would be a remarkable and horrifying uh, possibility, actually. So yeah, and then I can bring up the uh, the uh, habitable zone, and maybe you could just kind of give us an introduction to uh, uh, to a little bit about that. Right. So the um, so the sun is obviously the source of light and heat in our solar system, and it is very hot and it is very bright. And the closer you get to it, obviously, the, the more you're getting irradiated by it. So within our own solar system, there is a range of distances where it's you know it's the Goldilocks zone. It's the area where you're not getting too much heat and you're not getting too little heat. You're getting just enough heat that we have this kind of perfect temperature balance to allow liquid water to exist in large quantities on our surface. So you know, we have oceans because of that distance we are from the sun. If we were a lot closer to the sun, uh, odds are the you know the oceans would actually evaporate. They would boil away. Uh, we might get a much denser atmosphere like you see on. Um, on, on Venus, if we are further away, uh, even as far out as Mars, there's a good chance we would still have could have liquid water on the surface. We certainly have evidence that that large bodies of liquid water existed on Mars's surface in uh, in you know the the, the astronomical uh, recent astronomical history. Uh, but if you're too far out, then it's just not going to be warm enough. That anything that the, the average temperature of the Earth will be so low that everything's going to be in the ice stage. And so when you get to the asteroid belt and out further, really everything is going to be icy there. So different stars are different sizes and they're different temperatures. And so depending on the, the size and the, the temperature of the star, that habitable zone might be a lot closer in than is in our solar system, like in the Trappist one system. If you have a star that's actually bigger and hotter than the sun, then the habitable zone might be a lot further out. But the consequence of having a small star and a habitable zone that has to then be a lot closer because it's emitting less light and it's smaller radius, so you need to be closer to be warm by it, is that as you get closer to the star, the the the, uh, the rate of the orbit increases. You know, the length of your year decreases. So for a sun-like star, you would actually have to watch for many years to detect an Earth-sized planet by the transit method to see enough transit that you know that a planet's going on there. But if you go to a small star, like the TRAPPIST-1 star, uh, now you're looking at planets that their um, habitable zone would correspond to orbits of you know, a week or so. And turns out it's a lot easier to observe many weeks of data than it is to observe many years of data. Oh, really? So by observing smaller stars, you get a much better chance of detecting Earth-sized planets that are at the right distance that, that liquid water could potentially exist on the surface. And of course, we're very egocentric when it comes to exoplanet studies. We're always interested, can we find another Earth? Is there another place that might be enough like Earth that potentially we might find life there someday if, if you know, that's one of the, the, the big exciting goals of exoplanet science is, is finding some evidence of life popping up somewhere else in the universe. Well, actually, I think it's interesting too, as we were talking uh, when we were setting this program up, um, I mean, here we have third rock from the sun, Earth, which I mean, I think it's also worth noting, we're kind of at the, the, the most recent sort of uh, determinations of the habitable zone, kind of at the inner edge, like we're already um, 
you know, closer to the sun than maybe optimal. And, uh, and yet, you know, we also have this issue where we're making our planet a bit warmer. But um, what I thought was interesting too, is that actually the habitable zone is kind of an interesting, just sort of like general guideline. I mean, it's kind of biased toward, like you said, liquid water on the surface and, and really kind of even a little bit like about the size of the planets and things like that. What's really deeply biased by the size, it, 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 what we kind of have been calling this habitable zone for so long is so deeply tied to Earth's properties that I really feel like you have to define the habitable zone by saying it is the zone in which if you were to take Earth and place it as is at that distance from whatever star, that Earth would still maintain its liquid ocean. That's really what you're talking about. Because if Earth had a more heat trapping atmosphere, the habitable zone could be further out. Uh, you know, if you have smaller worlds uh, with less atmosphere, you know, it might be a little closer in. There, there's all, so many parameters just having to do with the conditions of the planet that affect what would be the right amount of radiation from the star to support water on its surface, you know. And then frankly, we've got bodies in the solar system that probably have, that seem to have huge liquid oceans. They just happen to be right. under layers of ice and they're right. much further out. So, so yeah, there's, uh, and you know, we are very actively interested in the possible of, of, of possibility of life arising on those. So, you know, in that case, you're talking about places that are way outside of what we call the habitable zone that could be habitable by life. So I, I really hate the term the habitable zone, but we, we, we're kind of stuck with it for a while. Yeah, uh, that's why I say that, you know, I would love to call it like the, the surface ocean zone, <laughs> something be a little more on, on target what it actually is a, a measure of. Well, so let's go ahead then, and with that, um, uh, let's go ahead and uh, have, actually, I'm, uh, I'm mostly piloting, but sometimes it's easier to let the computer do the, uh, the piloting for me. Uh, so this marker is the indication of uh, the location of the TRAPPIST-1 system. Uh, so we're just gonna head over there, uh, and we'll see um, the, the orbits of the planets coming into view. Uh, and what's cool is if you notice, like when you did that fly-in, you can see that the, the stars in the field, they, they shifted a little bit, but they didn't shift a lot. That um, uh, the hospitable zone, yeah, that, that works. <laughs> the, uh, uh, it's very cool. Light away is really like it's not like our next door neighbor, which is you know the, the Alpha Centauri, which is four light years away. But so it's not the house, the next door house. It, it's it's kind of a house at the end of the block in in cosmic storms. Right. Uh, if you look in the sky, the constellations, uh, the familiar constellations, would be kind of recognizable. They'd be a little jumbled, but definitely you could sort of pick out that you were still in our general neighborhood. I think it's cool too, because I mean, when we uh, when we flew in, you could see that we were coming in right basically uh, on the plane of the system, which of course is the case because we're, we're watching these uh, planets as they transit their parent star. So I think we have a question coming from online. Yeah, so uh, it turns out, yeah, we have learned a lot from the system with just our existing technology, just the ability to watch when these transits occur around the star have given us um, a lot of opportunity to characterize these planets. And, and one thing um, I, should, I haven't talked about yet has to do with the fact that here we're talking about a system where you have seven Earth-sized planets. They are in orbits that are actually more comparable to the orbits of the uh, uh, moons of Jupiter, <laughs> right? So here you have Earth-sized planets that are orbiting so close to one another that if you were actually to stand on the surface of one planet and look up at your neighboring planet when it passed, it would be as large in your sky as the moon appears to us in our sky, which is just like this phenomenal sci-fi concept that blew my mind. You see this in sci-fi illustrations all the time. And we've, I've always said, ah, yeah, that's not very realistic. There's no way you would see it in the neighboring planet. Well, maybe if you're in the TRAPPIST-1 system, you would. But that carries an extra implication that's amazing, that the, the, these are massive objects and they can actually influence each other's orbits gravitationally. They're orbiting so close that the timing of an orbit, if, if a planet is just orbiting off on its own, it's a very precise, like, like clockwork. It passes, it'll transit in front of the star at the same time every time it goes around. But because these planets are tugging on each other gravitationally, that actually changes the timing a little bit one way and the other. And it turns out, if you then keep observing the system in, in epochs over, over years and look at how the timing of the exact timing of those transits vary, you can actually run a lot of statistics and out of that calculate what the masses of these planets are. And that's phenomenal because in Star Trek, calculating the mass of a planet takes like 20 seconds and you push a button and you just know it. But astronomers don't have magic mass detectors like Star Trek does. We have to measure mass by watching how things influence other things. And in most cases, when we study Earth-sized planets, we don't.
influencing the that planet so we can't actually understand we know how big it is but we don't know what its mass is now there's a different technique we can use by discovering planets by how gravitationally it causes its star to wobble and we don't necessarily see the planet at all but we can detect something about the mass there but those are hard to do very very precisely and and i'd love to emphasize this in that the trappist one system we actually know the masses of these planets to precisions of better than like 10 percent uh, down, down to like five percent error bars which is unprecedented and it actually means these are the only earth-sized planets right now that we can make very intelligent comparisons to their uh their their densities to objects that we know in our own solar system and actually start to talk about what their composition would have to be in order to have that kind of density well, now maybe back to the question though we're to, uh, in the future telescopes like um the james webb space telescope even future telescopes may have a, an additional capability of helping us characterize what the atmospheres of transiting planets might be like by watching them at different wavelengths of light. You know, if a planet has a thick atmosphere, different gases have different wavelengths of light that they're basically opaque to, you can't see through. And so if you look at a transiting planet, if it has, uh, say, oxygen in its atmosphere, oxygen blocks certain wavelengths of light, and that makes the atmosphere will block more of the light than just the rocky planet does at those precise wavelengths. So through something called transmission spectroscopy and measuring whether the, the dip in brightness gets a little larger at certain wavelengths, we can actually deduce the chemistry of the atmosphere. We can figure out if a planet has water in its atmosphere or, or oxygen or nitrogen. And these would be things that we could then put together and start putting a picture together of what them, they might be like. And for instance, we find a planet that has a significant fraction of oxygen that would be a really important step towards concluding that maybe that's a situation where there, there could be life. Well, so we actually could fly up to some of the uh, of the sort of artist renditions of the planets that we have kind of orbiting our virtual star here. Uh, do you want to? Do you have a favorite one that you'd like to start with? And maybe you could describe, in the absence of some of that detailed understanding of exactly what's in the atmosphere, like how you made choices about how to depict these for. Uh, press releases sure. and covers of magazines and things like that. Well, why don't we start with uh, TRAPPIST 1c, the, the second okay. planet out, because the way we label planets in, in exoplanet systems, the, the, the we reserve the letter A to mean the, the star, and then B would be like the first discovered planet. So C in this case will be the third planet out. And so this planet's interesting because it's almost exactly the same diameter as Venus. It's almost exactly the same density as Venus. And it is receives fractionally about the same amount of light from its star that Venus does from our star. So this planet is as close an analog to Venus as I think you know, we're gonna see for the time being. So uh, the inspiration for what to make this planet look like came from Venus. Let's take something that looks a lot like that planet and, and do that. And, and you know, it was, um, it's very rare when doing exoplanet art to actually know so much about a planet that you say, yes, there is actually a direct analogy we can pull on. Let's make something that looks very, very similar to it. So, so TRAPPIST 1c is, is the, the, the closest sister planet to Venus that we currently know about. Very cool. So, but then if we, uh, we move on out from C to D, what was interesting is when uh, we did our first press release, uh, when Spitzer first revealed, you know, the, the additional planetary discoveries in the system, uh, and I should say Spitzer, uh, Spitzer is NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope, the uh, infrared component of NASA's Great Observatory Program. Uh, it uh, performed its duties for over 16 years with uh, uh, an incredible efficiency and sadly was recently decommissioned at uh, January 30th so uh, of this year. So it won't be doing any more observations, but it has uh, actually done uh, a remarkable job in helping us characterize exoplanets in the TRAPPIST-1 system, as well as many others, um, uh, particularly doing a lot of follow-up to the test mission. And we're going to see a lot more exoplanet science coming from Spitzer, even though it's decommissioned, because, you know, it takes a while from when you collect the data to when you and it's, know it's what it tells you. cool, too, kind of to that question that was asked before, that Spitzer wasn't designed to do this. It was really something that, uh, that just grew out of the kind of the need and the interest in doing it, right? Yeah, no, when Spitzer was first launched, we were under strict uh, uh, orders to not mention exoplanets as part of Spitzer's science palette because it wasn't designed to do this. But, um, you know, astronomers and engineers can be very clever. And when you put a tool in their hand, they can rethink how you need to do it. Uh, one of the remarkable things that, that the uh, science and engineering team of Spitzer was able to do long after launch is through only software upgrades because this thing there's no servicing mission to spitzer it was launched in its own orbit around the sun it left the earth immediately 
Uh, but through just software upgrades, we were able to increase the precision of its pointing by an order of magnitude, which actually enabled the stability we needed wow. to put the light from a star, not just on a pixel, but on a particular section of a pixel so that we could be, we could consistently measure its brightness to the precision we needed to detect these, you know, fraction of a percent variations in brightness to do these measurements. So, you know, that's one hell of a software upgrade. <laughs> yeah. Well, so anyway, so we're looking at um, uh, Travis 1D now. Yeah, so Travis 1D is the uh, smallest of uh, these uh, planets, known planets. It's uh, still a little bigger than than Mars, I think. But uh, uh, but what's interesting, it actually has the lowest density of the planets too. And so when you compare this to planetary models, one possible model that matches a planet of that size and density is one that has a significant fraction of water on its surface, potentially dozens of kilometers thick of water. So. Um, so the choice then was to show this one as a water world, as one of it, one possible interpretation that's consistent with what we observe. And that's kind of what we do when we do planet art, because obviously we don't know what each of these are, but if we can basically pick something that is consistent with what's known and tells part of that story, this is really where we want to go with it. Now, if we move on out from uh, uh, D to E, and you will now get to what is my personal favorite exoplanet, uh, uh, here, here's, here's a trick. Uh, e is like Earth. <laughs> <laughs> so TRAPPIST 1E is a planet that is just slightly smaller than the diameter of Earth. It has almost the same uh, uh, density as the planet Earth, and it receives slightly less of its star's illumination than the planet Earth, which, like we saw in your previous diagram, puts it right smack in what we would call the habitable zone or the uh, surface ocean zone of the TRAPPIST-1 star. So this is the planet that we, when we approached artistically, we, we wanted to show something that was potentially terrestrial because it, in, in a real sense, it is literally the closest analog to Earth that we have yet found in exoplanet searching. And it's likely to hold that record for a while because like I said, the ability to measure its mass so precisely that we know its density and understand that its density is very, very close to the density of Earth and thereby, you know, is consistent with this similar composition, right? I think it's gonna be a long time before we have other measurements of Earth-sized planets to that precision, unless they're around, you know, we find some around other indoor stars that we can investigate. So uh, right now, this is like, if you want like a sister planet to Earth that's around a, a cooler red star, this would be it. Um, Somehow, I, I, I we, we never made it into the uh, the press release. Like, what else do we know from science fiction? Where an, maybe an alien comes from a planet that's like Earth, and it's but it's a red star that suppresses maybe <laughs> natural abilities. I, uh, it's my uh, it's my vote for Krypton, actually. So, so actually, <laughs> just... this one hasn't hasn't been destroyed yet. We're uh... <laughs> right; it's still there. Well, um, so actually, then just for comparison, I just wanted to put the habitable zone. Uh, representation up for the TRAPPIST-1 system as well. Uh, and I guess, you know, it's kind of an interesting question then too, because since red dwarf stars are far more plentiful, potential kryptons perhaps far more plentiful than, uh, than, than stars like the sun, I mean, it does raise interesting questions about some of the challenges of living around a red dwarf star. Yeah, because obviously, just by the numbers, you can put a planet at the right distance to get the right amount of heat to maintain oceans on its surface. But we also know that red dwarf stars can be very, very active and have these incredible solar flares. I mean, you know, we we we, we see pictures of solar flares on the sun, and uh, you know, we occasionally hear about them, you know, wreaking havoc with communications and causing some power grid problems if they, you know, the solar flare interacts with our our um, our magnetosphere. But uh, we know of like uh, Proxima Centauri, the, uh, the, the nearest, nearest uh, uh, stellar object here. It has stellar flares that are so large, they, are, they actually are 10 times brighter than the light of the star. So if you were on a planet in, in, uh, around Proxima, and there was a, one of those flares, it would not be a subtle thing you would read about in the news later. It would be like, ah, <laughs> I'm getting sunburned it would be, immediately. It would be getting right. <laughs> and so, you know, how how does, you know, constant irradiation by, by stellar flares affect habitability? That's something that it's, you know, we, we don't know. 
and it's going to be something that we'll want to study. And this is why systems like TRAPPIST-1 are going to be so critical as we get new generations of telescopes to let us start to characterize their atmospheres. It'll start letting us have a laboratory of what happens to Earth-sized planets under different conditions. And um, I mean, so TRAPPIST-1, we haven't actually seen anything like the Proxima flares, but, but in that 500 hour period of, of observation, we actually do see significant flares pop mm -hmm. up in that same period. You can see, because you, know, you see a planet where the brightness dips a little bit, and the next week you see a whoosh, little spike where you know there was a stellar flare going on. Well then, um, so we're kind of heading up on the on the end of our time. Did you want to show the timing video that we talked about, or would you like to? Um, yeah, kind of sure. I mean, we've been talking a. about it. Might as well run that video up, and uh, we can just chat about it and finish our conversation while it's running. But so this video basically just shows the data. It shows the brightness of the Trappist one star as measured over time over these five hundred hours. And uh, you know, we start with a, an animation of uh, the uh, the Trappist one planets and they're color coded. So the color codes here are repeated later when we get to the video. And you know, th these are the relative timings of these planets. The outermost one takes about 20 days to go around. The innermost one takes about three days to go around. And so even if you are not a trained professional astronomer, it doesn't take much to look at this, this light curve, this brightness over time and say, oh yeah, I kind of see where these things are happening. These are each time the light dips down, right? That is corresponding to when the planet is passing across the disk of the star and reducing the, the overall brightness. And um, yeah, and so, but also, there, there's a stellar flare, by the way, <laughs> where it popped up uh, visibly. Uh, but this also tells you sort of why it was so critical for this kind of system to have such a long observation, because there's so many transits going on. How do you figure out, like, wait, which one is happening at the six day period? Which one's happening at the seven day period? Which one's happening in a nine day period, right? Sometimes, uh, you know, if, if you have this kind of system, you need a constant set of observations. And this is then the challenging part of exoplanet studies because you really want to be able to study things for long periods of time and at, at frequent sampling, because you don't want to just come back every five hours because you would miss these transits. These transits can be very, very short. That's why Kepler was off staring at one patch of sky for over four years. So we could really right. get detailed light curves on a bunch of stars all at once. But, you know, again, Kepler wasn't really sensitive to, um, to M dwarf stars. And... Right. But indoor stars are much more spread around, they're fainter, so you have to look at more nearby ones. So there's, there's, there's a perpetual series of trade-offs of the kind of telescope you have and which ones you, uh, uh, what kind of planet you're trying to study, and you have to design a mission to do that. Uh, so moons is a great question because right now we don't know uh, of any exomoons for sure. Uh, moons are a lot harder to find because they're going to be a lot fractionally smaller than the planet. Uh, what was interesting is when we knew that there were three planets in the system, and then we were seeing some funny twitches in the uh, in the light curve from ground-based observing. Uh, one of the theories was there might be a large exomoon there, and it turned out it wasn't actually an exomoon; it was a whole other planet that was affecting the data set. So, uh, but this is something that we're actually really, really interested in studying to see that you know is, can we find other planets like Earth that have relatively large moons? But you know, understand the moon is such a small fraction of the Earth; you're going to have to have increasingly precise measurements to detect the extra signal of the moon blocking part of the, the, the life of the star. Cool. Well, we have time for a couple more questions if there's anything else in the queue. Otherwise, um, we can also put up the website, the Spitzer uh, Trappist-1 website as well, if we, wanna, if we wanted to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, here, like, because Spitzer did a lot of the work characterizing and discovering some of these planets, uh, you know, we have a whole site set up where we've got all our assets and the artwork and the animations. Uh, we've actually also developed a VR experience that you can also just view as a uh, YouTube 360 video, either just on your phone, or if you have a headset, then you can get it immersively. And it takes you through a, uh, if you have a, a Oculus or Vive headset, you can actually go through a 3D pass through the system and really get a sense of the scales and distance and and really when you're at one planet how big did the other planets look to you so um, uh, i encourage people to check that out uh the jpl exoplanet travel uh, exoplanet travel bureau has sort of an artistic sense of what it might be like to be standing on the surface of a, a trappist one world uh trappist 1d so uh, i encourage you to take that out uh, check that out as well and uh, i don't know are, are, are any other questions for us very cool. Well, I don't see any others. So, um, you know, this will be on Facebook, so we might have some follow-up questions. And uh, if so, we'll follow up with you and see if we can get some good answers. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Robert, for sharing this time with us and uh, and launching our 
Cosmic Conversations on Fridays, 11.30 a.m. Pacific. And uh, have a great rest of your day. You as well. Uh, I, I uh, Isolate and stay healthy. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.